Hey, it's Kevin DeWitt here. Welcome to the first video in the second part of the Setting Up a Home Music Studio course. In this video, we're going to start off with studio monitors. So studio monitors are one of the things that I would consider to be the next step and moving your home music studio forward from the bare essentials on to getting greater and more advanced in your setup. So it's a key component to your setup primarily because it's recommended for mixing and mastering as opposed to headphones. Obviously in the recording phase it's not so critical unless you want to make sure that just the sound quality is right but if you've got a good set of headphones you can obviously do that and that's what we go over in the bare essentials part of it. But if you want to take your home music studio to the next level and you want to start mixing and start getting your songs to sound really, really good uh, on any sources and you know out to the public, etc., then studio monitors is definitely the way to go. Now studio monitors can range in lots and lots of brands, sizes, and definitely range in price. They can range from anywhere that's sort of mid-level priced to uh, extreme prices. It really is hard to find anything that I would consider to be cheap in the realms of studio monitors. Now, that's not to say there isn't stuff that is technically cheap, but when I say cheap, generally they will be actually cheap and probably not something I'd recommend. So be prepared that this is something that you're gonna spend a bit of money on. Now, when I say a bit of money, I'm not necessarily talking tens of thousands of dollars or anything like that, but you know, I would be suggesting that you'd be looking at $500 at an absolute minimum plus on top of that. You know, a decent set is gonna be probably more in the realms of $1,000 or up. Now, one of the main reasons that I haven't recommended studio monitors in the bare essential side of things is because the impact on your room is greater and the fact that you are really going to need some uh, acoustic treatment in your room to get those studio monitors to work properly and get the frequencies balanced and sounding right to you in the room you know it's all well and good to have very expensive studio monitors that sound absolutely pristine and perfect and flat response but if your room is skewing all those frequencies by nulling out certain ranges and boosting other ranges and getting massive reflections off hard walls and floors, etc., then you're really not going to get the quality you expect out of those studio monitors. And when you go and play your music in other locations, it's just going to sound wrong and just it's just not going to work. Now, similarly to headphones, as I suggested in the Bare Essentials section, part one, you are going to be looking for studio monitors that are fairly flat response. And again, the reason is the same as I explained in the headphones. So the reason you want your studio monitors to have a flat frequency response is that we want to be able to mix our songs evenly across the frequency spectrum as much as possible so that it is enjoyable and playable on as many sources as possible, whether somebody has a system that boosts the highs or boosts the lows or boosts the mids or reduces any of those ranges, your song will sound pretty good on all of them as opposed to if you mix on speakers and systems that are not balanced and not flat for response, because you're already going to have your mixes skewed, they're not going to work on you know some of those systems. Now you're also going to find that studio monitors are very detailed and precise in the sounds that you hear. You know, the first time I got studio monitors, I was just astounded by what I was hearing in music. I was hearing music at a totally different level than what I was used to. I was used to listening in the car, on normal crappy earbuds and headphones or hi-fi systems in the, in the family room, etc. And even though they sound good, the detail was just not there. And I didn't even know it wasn't there until I got studio monitors and then suddenly I could just hear all this extra stuff in songs from the professionals and I just, it was just amazing what I was hearing. And 
that's going to be great for you creating your music because you're going to hear that stuff or you're going to hear that stuff missing from your songs that you need to add and that's the beauty of studio monitors. Now the other thing with studio monitors and what's recommended for mixing over headphones is not only do they accurately represent music better than headphones do but because they are actually not attached to your head they are not isolating your ears and separating the stereo field totally isolation independent so you are getting that natural blur of the stereo field not only being separate to a point but also merging together into the center mono sort of signal to hit you in the face and hit your ears together so that you get more of a true representation of what most people are going to hear now obviously listening on headphones is going to give you an accurate representation of what people are going to hear when they listen on headphones but if you want to hear what people are going to hear in their car or on a hi-fi system or somewhere else then studio monitors are the way to go for that While there's lots and lots of models of studio monitors out there and brands and prices etc there's two types of monitors primarily there is active monitors and passive monitors and the best way to tell the difference is is that active monitors have their own power supplies and amplifiers built into each speaker and you usually tell that because they'll have a power cord that goes into each speaker you plug a cable directly from your audio interface into that speaker and it may have a volume control and on off switch etc passive speakers are basically just a speaker and they require a separate power source and a separate amplifier to run those speakers now a lot of studios will potentially have both or one or the other but primarily for a home music studio the recommendation for me anyway is to go with active it's so much simpler you don't need to get that extra power or extra uh, amplifier that's in a separate box you don't have to worry about any of that it's all enclosed into the speakers also the active speakers have been designed by the manufacturer to have the best sound that they can produce with the right amplifier and power source within the speaker itself so they've designed it to sound that way if you go and get passive speakers and then you get a different brand of amplifier they can't guarantee what sort of sound quality you're going to get and whether it's what they expected to come out of the speakers whereas with actives you can now a lot of the time passive monitors can also be a lot more expensive because they are more boutique style they're more uh, in the extreme levels of speakers whereas the actives you'll find it generally in the cheaper models but they're not always cheap they are expensive as well so don't take that as a active monitors are always cheaper that's not necessarily the case but you generally won't find very cheap passive speakers now one of the key components with picking your uh, studio monitors other than listening to them which is what I definitely recommend uh, is size okay so most people are going to have a tendency to go oh, I want the biggest speakers all right and you'll see pictures of professional studios where they've got these monster size speakers and that's great you know that's perfect for them because they have their studios built to take those speakers they're they're built to represent the frequencies responses fine and they'll have no problems at all because they're just designed for those speakers your home is not designed for speakers like that okay so even though you may think they sound great there's a good chance they're not going to represent properly now most home music studios are typically going to be looking at speakers of a size of around five and six inches now if you really need some big thumping low end or you've got a really big room maybe you'll push to seven or eight inches but you know six or even five for a little tiny room is going to be quite enough it's going to seem ridiculous when you look at them they look small but they're louder than you think they're a lot more accurate than you think the difference is is that they will lack a little bit of low end in the smaller speakers but the reason that that's usually recommended is because most home music studios 
can't handle low end frequencies very well. That's generally where all of the problems with your frequency response in your room is. Now, when we get to the video where we talk about acoustic treatment, we're obviously going to try and tackle these frequency response issues, but treating low end is very, very difficult. Even with lots of treatment, it can still not be something that you can solve in your room because they're just not designed for it. And the amount of treatment you need to fix really low end frequencies is massive as amount. That's just impractical and way too expensive for a home music studio. So even though we're gonna try and control the low end as much as we can in the acoustic treatment, one simple way to do it is obviously not to put too much low end in. So if you imagine that your room has a problem with say 60 Hertz, nice low end where the kick sits or bass guitar even, and it's representing that low end too much. It's boosting it too much because of the bouncing of the frequencies off the walls and the balance of the room, etc. Now, if you go and add big studio monitors in that room that really pump that low end out, it's going to push the room even harder and make the problem even worse than it originally was because you can imagine the more low end you put into your room the more the room's going to even heighten more and balance, uh, throw out the balance even greater again. So this is why the recommendation of having small or medium sized speakers is great in a home music studio because if you do have a problem with your low end because you're not pushing way too much low end out of these speakers the balance is not going to be wrong. It's, you're not going to throw the room right out of control. You're gonna try and keep it under control as much as possible. Now this same theory goes for subwoofers. Most people were naturally gonna be drawn to saying, I wanna add a subwoofer to my system, especially if you do get these smaller studio monitors that lack some bass, you're gonna to wanna to get a subwoofer because you're gonna think it sounds thin and weak and you wanna get that low end thump coming through. Now the problem is exactly the same problem happens. You put a subwoofer into a room that has a bad frequency response and suddenly you're boosting this low end that goes totally out of control, smears all of your sound frequencies and everything else and it's just way too much for the room to handle and all of your bass response goes out the window and you can't mix properly because it's all out of balance. If you do intend to want to add a subwoofer because maybe you're somebody that deals with a lot of low end or you are, you know, you're doing songs like EDM that requires a lot of low end and you really need to hear it. My recommendation with that is, is that it's not necessarily not to get one, but don't mix with it on all the time. So what I like to do, and I do this in my own studio, so I'll mix on my studio monitors without the subwoofer and I'll get my mix to where I think it sounds fantastic. Then I'll turn my subwoofer on and have a listen. See how that impacts the song. See if it enhances the song. See if it throws it out of control. Now on top of that, I'll also then go and check it on other systems because I know that the subwoofer is not going to be reliable in my room. So even though I do listen to it with the subwoofer to hear what it sounds like in the room, I still need to take it to other sources and other locations to see how that has impacted it. And if I go out to my car and I find that I've got a lot of low end, then I don't need to add more in my studio. Now subwoofers can be, and most normally are, very expensive, especially if you want to get a good quality one. So most of the brands of the studio monitors that you'll be looking at also make a subwoofer that can go with it and pair with it. It's obviously a good idea that if you're going to get it to get a subwoofer from the same manufacturer that pairs with those speakers because they're, they're basically going to, the sound profile is going to be similar. You know they're going to work together because the manufacturers made them want to work together. But of course the problem is these are going to be expensive and it's something that I would look at as an optional item further down the track. I would stick mainly first stage to stick with just your studio monitors and look at a subwoofer later if need be, unless you can get a great deal on a bargain as a pack or something like that, a bundle. So when you're looking for your studio monitors, obviously the biggest recommendation is to go and try them. 
you know, in an ideal perfect situation, if you're in a location where you have a local music store that will let you borrow or loan studio monitors, the ideal situation would be to take them into your actual home music studio, put them on your desk or whatever you plan on putting them on and have them listen and comparing. Pick the ones that sound right to you, okay? You can find recommendations online and that's a good idea to do that to get some pros and cons, but at the end of the day, it needs to suit your music style and what you're listening for, okay? One person's judgment on studio monitors is not gonna be the same as yours or somebody else's. Everybody has their own favorite of studio monitors and a lot of people haven't tried them all. So their, their, their judgment or their review is based on only what they've heard. You know, nobody that I know has heard every single studio monitor out there and can clearly say this one is the best but they know what they've tried and they know what they like out of those ones they've tried. So if you're in a situation like I am where there really is no local music stores, there's no chance of trying them, there's really no chance of hearing them, I was 100% only on reviews, recommendations, pricing, demonstrations online. Now obviously demonstrations are pretty much useless online because it's not like you can hear the audio quality from one speaker to another watching it on YouTube. You're just never gonna get that. So in my case, it was a bit of blind luck of purchasing something online and just hoping that all of the forums and stuff that I reviewed and analysis that I did online of specs and size and everything else was going to pay off and I was going to get something that sounded great. Now, I've been through a few sets of studio monitors. You know, I started off fairly cheap, as cheap as I could go with some um, Behringer speakers. You know, they were a great starting point. They sounded great. They're technically considered cheap, people will frown on them, but they're a great starting point if that's where your budget sits. But as I progressed and moved my business forward and got my skills better and my ears more trained and things like that, I wanted to move up levels. So, you know, then I went on to some Atoms, which are another fantastic set of speakers. They're, you know, a next level up from that. And now I'm sitting with some uh, Focals, which are even another level up. Now saying that, even mine are still what I would consider probably, you know, mid, mid to high-ish price bracket style speakers, but there's plenty more to go with that. Even in the brand that I have, they have models that way supersede this model that I have and go way beyond. So, you know, there's extremes that you can go to massive levels. And especially if you get to the mastering phase, you know, some of these professional mastering engineers that have massive studios, they have speakers that are worth more than I would, that anybody would get paid in an entire year salary. You know, it could be worth more than my entire house. Now, I'm not gonna go to that level unless I'm gonna be making enough money to pay those speakers back. So you need to find that right sweet spot between your budget and the quality that you wanna get out of it. There's nothing wrong with starting off on the cheaper end of the studio monitors and then working your way forward as you go, selling the old ones, buying new ones and progressing and moving up your quality of gear as you go. Now once you do pick your studio monitors, one key major component is obviously placement of those studio monitors. So, in all the previous steps, you've you, and you may have already built your Bare Essentials Home Music Studio, you'll have your desk in place, everything's sort of set up. Now, hopefully, if you're watching this video, that means that you put your desk in a spot that was going to suit studio monitors when you get to this position. If you haven't, then obviously you need to go back and factor that in before you get your studio monitors. So, as I discussed in those ones with studio monitors, you want your desk central to the side walls in your room so that when you put your studio monitors on the desk or on stands, whichever option you want to go for, that they are at equal distance away from the side walls, equal distance away from the back walls, equal distance away from the front walls, etc. And when I say equal distance from the back and front and sides, I'm not talking like the side distance should be the same as the back distance, I'm talking each speaker should be the same distance from the back and front, okay? Ideally, what you want is different distances between each of the directions. So the side distance is different to the front distance, it's different to the back distance, it's different to the height, 
and the floor because having them all equal, you're gonna end up with these major dips and frequency response problems because of the designs of the room and the, the waveforms bouncing back at equal uh, times. They're gonna cancel each other out a lot. So having them all at sort of different distances or as much different distances as possible is going to break that those waveforms up. They're not gonna hit at exactly the same time and you'll get less uh, nulls or less boosts of frequencies in your room. So as I suggested, there's like sort of two main ways to sort of mount your speakers, okay? You're either gonna sit them on your desk or you're going to put them on separate stands. And that's gonna depend on the desk situation that you set up, where you need to place those speakers. A lot of people will recommend stands, but I have them on my desk. Um, all you need to do is make sure you do some acoustic treatment under them, which we'll talk about in another video. So the other thing you need to do, and again, refer to the manual of the speakers first, because some speakers can be slightly different in the way they operate, but majority of studio monitors, you're going to have them sitting on your desk at an angle so they are pointing towards your ears. Okay, you want them sort of pointing towards you, facing you, looking straight at you, as opposed to straight on, you want them angled towards you. And you want the tweeters, which are the smaller speakers, if you're not sure, like if you get a pair of studio monitors, got a big speaker and a little speaker, that's usually the tweeter, that should be sitting at about ear level. Now, if it's not sitting at ear level because of your placement, your desk height or your seat height, whatever it is, you should angle the speaker so that it's almost like the tweeter is pointing at your ear or it's looking at it. Imagine it's an eye and it's looking. You want it looking at your ears. All right, so you might have to angle your studio monitors down or up, depending on what level you're at. And the recommendation is, is that you create what they call sort of an equilateral triangle, which is basically a triangle that has all sides equal or even. So you need to sort of work out where your seat sits and where you sit with your head will be in that seating position and then get a tape measure out and measure sort of the distance from the speaker cone to just behind where your head would be on both speakers. Make sure they're the same distance, but then the distance between the speakers from cone to cone should also be the same distance as that. So it will create a triangle that is of all equal sides. Now, if you can get that and the angle right, then you've got your speakers, your studio monitors in prime position for your studio. Now with all that said, I always recommend that you check your songs and your mixes on other references as well and other locations, okay? There's flaws in your home music studio. Your studio monitors are not going to be perfect, okay? They're going to be good or great, but they're not gonna be perfect. And you've gotta keep in mind that people are not listening on the same speakers as you. So while yours are great, theirs might be crap or they might be better than yours. So you need to test your music on different sources. So I always recommend that you do all your mixing on studio monitors, but compare them in other locations, all right? You might even set up a couple of crappy computer speakers in your studio to listen to the mix on while you're doing it. Just, you know, rough AB, check, listen, anything out that sounds wrong, frequency responses sound wrong on that. Take it to your hi-fi system in your family room, lounge room, whatever you got. Take it out to the car. Car is a favorite place for lots of mixing engineers to check their mixes on because most people know what songs sound like in their car because every time they're in their car, they're listening to music. So they know what to expect and what it sounds like. So check your songs on it. See what they sound like. Check your songs on your studio headphones. Check your songs on earbuds, Apple earbuds, Beat headphones, whatever else you've got, check your songs on. Check them on crappy mono speakers, right? So you wanna check everything as you go because even though your studio monitors are gonna be fantastic, that you still need to make sure that your songs work in other locations. 
All right, so if you're interested in getting yourself some studio monitors, go and do some research, check out some pricing, check out different models. Uh, if you have any questions or you wanna ask opinions about any of them, please put it in the comments. I can't guarantee that I have used half of these speakers or know anything about them, but I'm happy to provide any guidance that I can on what I may know about them or what I've heard about them, or other people in the Facebook group or uh, in the comments can also help if they've had any experience with it. So please ask any questions. If you have any questions about the whole thing of studio monitors, whether you should get them, how to buy them, how to place them in your studio, whatever, please again, ask the questions. I'm here to guide you through the process and want to get you to your dream studio, uh, home music studio setup. So hopefully this video has helped you in that regard and I've covered everything you need to know about studio monitors. And I thank you for watching this and I will catch you in the next video.